for our next topic for lecture, we're talking about virology. And this is the study of viruses. So we'll talk about viral structure, we'll talk about how viruses multiply or replicate, and we'll talk a little bit about viral diseases toward the end. And remember, this is an introductory class, and so this we're only talking about virology for like this one lecture, and this is just barely scratching the surface on virology. But first a little review, because this is going to come up again later in this lecture, and I really want you to know the central dogma of molecular biology. So go ahead and pause here, or don't go to the next slide yet, and think about how does that genetic information flow. This is what we talked about whenever we went through microbial genetics on the previous lecture. So recall that the central dogma of molecular biology states that the flow of genetic information happens in this one direction. We start with DNA and we're getting proteins out of it. The instructions for these proteins are in the DNA. So it goes from DNA, which is transcribed into mRNA, which is then translated into protein. That is the flow of information stated by the central dogma of molecular biology. And the ultimate goal is to change from this language of nucleic acids, which would be DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids, into this language of amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So where in the cell does transcription take place? This would take place with the genetic material. So in prokaryotes, it would be in the nucleoid region, wherever the DNA is, that's in their nucleoid region. And in eukaryotes, it would take place inside the nucleus, because eukaryotes have a membrane around their genetic material called the nucleus. Where does translation take place in these two organisms? Translation takes place at the ribosome, and ribosomes in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes are in the cytoplasm. So where does the uh, transcription take place in the cell? It takes place wherever their genetic material is, the nucleoid or nucleus. Translation takes place at the ribosome in the cytoplasm. Make sure you know the difference between those two in terms of the different organisms. And before we start diving into viruses, let's keep everything relevant. We're in microbiology right now, we're studying microbiology, so why do we care about viruses? Why are we even studying them in the field of microbiology? And that's of course because they are microscopic. And for this class, since we're talking about medical microbiology, viruses can cause diseases in humans. So we're talking about them because they're relevant to human health and they are microscopic. Now viruses are microscopic, so we need a microscope to see them, but the microscopes that we use in lab, the light microscopes, are not powerful enough to see viruses. To see a virus, which is very, very small, you need something called an electron microscope. Our light microscopes in lab go up to about a thousand times magnification, and electron microscopes can go up to two million times magnification. So that gives you an idea of the difference of those magnification powers for these microscopes. Here's some micrographs or images from an electron microscope. We have a scanning electron microscope and a transmission electron microscope. Both of these images though are showing something called bacteriophages. And these are special viruses that only infect bacteria. And we'll return to those in a, in a little bit. But look at this. These are actual images from an electron microscope. Imagine the first person that looked at a bacteriophage underneath an electron microscope. Isn't that just amazing? They look like little aliens. I love how um, bacteriophages look. And we'll talk about those again in a few slides. This image down here on the bottom right as well, this is showing a bacterial cell. I'm kind of outlining it with my pointer now. And this bacterial cell has been infected with bacteriophages, with these viruses that infect bacteria. And all these little black dots inside are virus that has replicated, and it's probably going to burst the cell soon and release all these viral particles out into the environment to infect other cells. So how did we find out that viruses exist? If they're so tiny, how did we even find out that they exist? Humans have actually been preventing or curing viral infections way before we even knew what a virus 
actually was or what was really causing that infection. Think back to Edward Jenner, the father of immunization. He's the one that inoculated patients with a cowpox vaccine to prevent the more serious smallpox. Both of those are caused by viruses, but he created this vaccine and prevented this viral infection 130 years before the electron microscope was even invented, so he couldn't see the infectious agent, the virus. But we were aware, again, that things were making people sick, even though we couldn't see them. Now jump forward to Dmitry Ivanovsky. He was a Russian botanist, and he was studying something called tobacco mosaic disease. Tobacco mosaic disease was a disease of tobacco plants, and it destroys the leaves of tobacco plants and really impacts the tobacco industry. So at the time, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, Dmitry Ivanovsky was studying this disease of tobacco plants. And he did this research, he was trying to figure out what was causing the disease, where he broke down the plant and then filtered it through teeny tiny pores less than 0.1 microns. So he was trying to filter out what was causing the disease because a pore is this small should capture all the bacteria. And so he filtered it out and then he re-infected uh, plants with that filtered material, which shouldn't have infected plants because the bacteria was filtered out, right? But that filtered material still infected plants. And so the conclusion was there must be a component smaller than bacteria that was causing this tobacco mosaic disease. So you can imagine, everyone was like, what? Things can be smaller than bacteria and still make things sick? So that was the big breakthrough here. And we couldn't see it yet though because the electron microscope still was not invented until after 1930. And so at the time, people believed that it must be some type of toxin or chemical that was causing the disease. And then that's where viruses actually got their name from. It's derived from the Latin virus, which means poison. Now we know though that it is an actual biological structure and it still maintains the name virus, but it does have specific uh, structures and components. It's not just a toxin or just a chemical. This is just to give you a visual of tobacco mosaic disease. This is what it ultimately does to tobacco plant leaves. It breaks down the leaf and destroys the plant's ability to get energy through photosynthesis, causing the plant to die. And tobacco mosaic disease is caused by the tobacco mosaic virus. And fun fact, the tobacco mosaic virus was the first one to actually be viewed under an electron microscope and actually seen. Um, so the shape was observed and the actual particle was observed. So we knew it was an actual particle, not a molecule or some type of chemical that was causing the disease. And we're going to see in later slides that these uh, viruses have different shapes. And tobacco mosaic disease or tobacco mosaic virus has this kind of helical structure or kind of tube-like structure. And look here at the scale on the bottom left-hand corner. Now we're talking about nanometers. With bacteria, we're, we mostly talk about microns, but now that we're down to the viral level, the viral scale, we're talking about nanometers. So for something to be considered a virus, it has to meet certain viral characteristics. And those characteristics are, one, they are very, very small. So they're too small to see with a light microscope. The microscope we use in the lab, you have to use an electron microscope. And most often we're talking about the scale of nanometers instead of microns. Next up, viruses are obligate intracellular particles, and pay close attention to this word right here. Viruses are called particles, not cells. Viruses are not cells because they're not considered living things, and they don't have all of the components of a cellular organism, so they're called particles. And they're intracellular particles. They cannot survive outside of the host cell. You may also see them referred to as parasites. You may also see them as obligate intracellular parasites. They can't undergo metabolism on their own. And think back to the metabolism lecture. So living things can go through aerobic, anaerobic. Those are all types of metabolism in order using some type of outside source in order to break it down and get energy.
viruses are not able to do that whole pathway by themselves. So they don't have all of the genes necessary to make the products they need in order to replicate. So they have to hijack or be a parasite. They have to hijack the host cell metabolic machinery, the parts that they don't have. And then that's what they use to make copies of, of themselves within the host cell. And then finally, viruses can infect all cellular organisms. There's a whole variety of viruses and they are highly, highly, highly specific. So this means that viruses can infect humans. We know that, we've talked about flu virus. They can infect animals. So think of rabies, that's caused by a virus. Plants, we talked about tobacco mosaic disease. And then they can also specifically infect bacteria and we'll see that on the next slide. And like I said, this host range is very specific. So in most cases, of like a virus that infects a plant is not going to be able to infect a human. And it's usually very, very um, tissue specific too. So a virus has to bind to a very specific cell within an organism, or it has to bind to a very specific type of bacteria. So there are many millions of types of viruses all over the planet that infect all types of living things. What type of host does a bacteriophage infect? So a bacteriophage is a type of virus. And look at the word here, bacteriophage. Bacteriophages are a type of virus that specifically infect bacteria. Now onto this hot button topic, is a virus alive? And think back whenever we were looking at the tree of life and we talked about bacteria and archaea and eukarya, viruses were not on the tree of life. They're really not considered to be living things. That's because they don't have the enzymes necessary for replication. They're obligate intracellular parasites and they require a host. So they're not able to replicate on their own. So they're not considered living things. Now this is something that you should take a moment and think about on yourself because this is a, this is a debated topic. There's not necessarily a right answer or a wrong answer, but do you consider viruses to be alive? Think about that for a second. Now, because viruses are so simple, they, they're not considered living things because they are so simple and because they don't have a lot of components making them up, they're not able to replicate themselves. This makes it really difficult to develop antiviral drugs. So it's a huge challenge because they're very simple and because viruses are so closely related to host cell function. Viruses are hijacking host cell function. So what part of the viral replication cycle do we target in order to get rid of a virus that's infected us without hurting our own cells? And that is the, kind of the challenge behind developing antiviral drugs. Now let's take a look at this simple viral structure and compare this in your brain to the images of like the prokaryote and the eukaryote structures and just uh, appreciate kind of how simple this viral structure is because we're going to go into more detail on this on the next slide but these are really the only things i'm ever going to ask you about in terms of viral structure so the envelope uh, envelope proteins or glycoproteins on the surface and then a viral genome and really all viruses don't have envelopes, so all viruses don't even need this. So the only things that a virus absolutely needs are a capsid and a viral genome. And this capsid is this protective coating around its genome made of proteins. And then the viral genome are, of course, the instructions on how it is the virus that it is gives it instructions on how to hijack the cell and what specific cell that it attaches to in order to infect it. And that's and those are really the only two components it absolutely needs. But we'll talk about envelope viruses and where they get this envelope from. So here are these components again. We have viral structure, nucleic acid, or the viral genome. So this you can think of as the same thing. We have the capsid that's protecting or covering that nucleic acid. And then we have an envelope on the outside that I said not all viruses have an envelope. And then on that envelope, they can have certain proteins on the surface um, in order to bind to their certain cell type. Now, viruses are weird because 
virus nucleic acid can actually be RNA or DNA. It can be double-stranded or single-stranded, and it can be circular or linear. So for prokaryotes and eukaryotes, their genomes were all double-stranded DNA. Viruses are weird, though, um, and they're not considered living things, so I guess they, ca they can break these rules, right? But they can have these different variations. And another thing to note here is that they only can have one of these variations, though. So they can have double-stranded RNA, but that means they don't have, like, single-stranded DNA. So they can have one or the other, but not a mix of all of these. Now take a look at this viral diagram and see if you're able to identify what these different structures are. A, we have the viral genome. And remember, the viral genome can be double-stranded or single-stranded. It can be RNA or DNA. It can be circular or linear. B is the capsid. And the capsid is made of proteins in order to protect the viral genome and also plays an important role in attaching to its cell and getting this viral genome into a cell. And then C is the envelope. And not all viruses have an envelope. The only two things a virus absolutely needs is its a genome and a capsid. Viral capsids, or those proteins that are protecting the genetic material, can come in different shapes. So the proteins that make up a capsid are called capsomers, and those proteins can come together and join together and build different shaped um, capsids based on what type of virus it is. So for example, the Paco mosaic virus has this cool helical shape where all the capsomers orient themselves in kind of this twisting motion. You can have this icosahedral shape that is very geometric looking. And then a complex shape is a combination of these different shapes in one organism. Another image just showing these viral capsid shapes again. We have helical, we have polyhedral or icosahedral. So this is one that has faces on it. This is very geometric faces. Spherical viruses, spherical viruses are still made up of the capsomers, but it actually has such tiny geometric faces on it that it ends up appearing spherical. And then a bacteriophage, or a virus that infects bacteria, is an example of a complex structure because it has a combination of this polyhedral or icosahedral capsid orientation, and you can also see it has this helical orientation down here as part of its tail. Now let's take a look at the different parts of a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages look really cool. And like I said, they're a complex structure because it has this very geometric capsid that contains the viral genome. And then it has this sheath area that has this helical structure that is still composed of certain types of capsomer proteins. And then it has these tail fibers that help it attach to its host cell. And it looks very alien-like, does it? Almost like, and very like spider-like. Very, bacteriophages are really cool and very fascinating. They're really fun to look at. And what's happening here, whenever a bacteriophage infects a bacterial cell, we can see this micrograph or this image from a microscope to the left. A bacteriophage will actually rest itself and attach specifically to the surface of a bacterial cell. So here's the surface right here. And then this is where all of the viral genome is contained, right in its capsid head up here. And it will actually inject itself, it's like a syringe or a needle, it will inject this viral genome into the bacterial cell. And then now that the viral genome is inside the bacterial cell, now it can use that genome to hijack the bacteria's uh, metabolic machinery in order to replicate this genome, make more of itself, and make more bacteriophages. Really, really, really cool stuff. Now that you know the different parts of a virus, we can talk a little bit about viral taxonomy, or how we classify viruses. So there are many types of viruses because viruses can infect all of living things, right? So how do we classify viruses? We can classify them based on their shape, 
So they're capsid shaped. They could be helical. They could be polyhedral. They could be complex like a bacteriophage. What type of host cell they infect? There are many, many, many types of viruses based on what specific type of uh, animal or species or cell type that they infect. We just talked about bacteriophages, specifically infecting bacteria. The presence or absence of an envelope. Not all viruses have an envelope. If they have an envelope, they are called enveloped. If they do not have an envelope, they are called non-enveloped or naked viruses. And viruses get this envelope from the host cell, so they are not able to make the lipids or the structures to make this envelope themselves, so they actually steal it from the host cell whenever they leave the host. And we'll see that in the next, uh, we'll see that coming up kind of soon. And then also we can classify our viruses based on their nucleic acid, because remember it can be DNA or RNA, double-stranded or single-stranded, circular or linear, but they can only have one variation of this type. So if they have single-stranded RNA that's linear, that's their nucleic acid type, that's their viral genome, they don't have a mixture of these. Now let's jump into viral life cycles. And we're gonna break this up into two main parts. So first we'll talk about bacteriophages. We'll talk about how bacteriophages go through the lytic and the lysogenic cycles, how they're able to replicate themselves inside of bacterial cells, because we're talking about bacteriophages. And then we'll talk about animal viruses and their life cycles. We'll specifically talk about the examples of influenza and HIV. And when we're talking animal cells or um, animal viruses, remember humans are animals, so we are talking about humans in that realm. All right, so let's start off talking about this bacteriophage life cycle. And remember, a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So here's our bacteriophage in this image, it's these little yellow guys. And then the bacteria is this blue oval. And we're going to talk about the difference between the two cycles, lytic and lysogenic. And these are both life cycles that happen once the bacteriophage infects a bacterial cell. So let's start with the lytic cycle. So first off, the bacteriophage has to attach to and infect the bacterial cell because viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. It has to infect a host cell, and that's this bacterial cell right here. So the bacteriophage infects, it inserts its genetic material into the cell, it takes that genetic material and then hijacks the cell's metabolic machinery so it can make more of itself, and it makes a bunch of new bacteriophage viruses inside of the cell, and then the cell bursts, releasing all of these new viruses, and now these viruses can go infect a new bacterial cell. So that's the lytic cycle. And the important thing here is lysis or the cell the host cell breaking or bursting open to release viral particles so the lytic cycle ends in cell death where the cell bursts open with viral particles now let's look at the lysogenic cycle the lysogenic cycle also has to begin with a bacterial cell being infected by a bacteriophage because it needs a host cell so for the ly lysogenic cycle, a bacteriophage infects the host cell, but instead of directly replicating itself and bursting the cell, it actually integrates itself into the host genome. So you see, here's the viral genome and here's the host bacterial genome. During the lysogenic cycle, it becomes one chromosome and the viral genome is inserted into the host genome. And this is called a prophage. At this point, it's a prophage. And then this is, at this point, the host cell can then just go through binary fission and divide and replicate and make more of itself. And as the bacterial cell is making more of itself, it's also replicating the viral genome for the virus and making more and more of the viral genome. Eventually, the virus is triggered to pinch itself off from the host genome and then it enters the lytic cycle where it hijacks the host cell's metabolic machinery, makes a bunch of itself, and then kills the cell. 
So the big difference between the two is that the lytic cycle ends in cell death. The lysogenic cycle involves the formation of a prophage where the viral genome is inserted into the bacterial genome. And we'll see this again over the next few slides, but the big takeaway here is that all viruses end up killing the host cell. So they all end up going through the lytic cycle. All viruses do not go through the lysogenic cycle. All viruses do not necessarily make a prophage and integrate into the host chromosome. This is just a possible cycle they can enter if they integrate themselves into the host genome. So let's look at the stages involved in specifically the lytic cycle when a bacteriophage infects a bacterial cell. So we have our bacteriophage that attaches to the surface of a bacterial cell. That's called attachment, one. And then two, we have penetration. So the viral genome ins is inserted into the host cell and it penetrates into the cytoplasm where the host genome resides. And then three, we have biosynthesis. This is where it's hijacking that host machinery and making a bunch of parts to make new viral particles. And then on the next slide, we'll see the last two steps of this lytic cycle. And then the last two steps, we have maturation or putting those uh, synthesized parts together to make complete viral particles. And then finally, release. We're talking about the lytic cycle. So the host cell lyses or breaks open to release viral particles that are then going to go and infect other bacterial cells. So know the steps involved in the bacteriophage lytic cycle. This is going to look a lot like the um, animal virus replication cycle, which is great. You only have to learn it once, but definitely know the steps involved. So adsorption is the same thing as attachment. Those are interchangeable words. Adsorption, not absorption like, uh, like a sponge absorbs liquid. Adsorption and attachment. And that's that specific viral attachment to its host cell. The host cell and the, and the virus have extreme specificity in terms of attaching to each other. And then penetration. That's that bacteriophage injecting its genome into the bacteria. And then replication, making more of its viral genome and making all the parts it needs to make a complete virus. Assembly, putting those parts together. And then release or lysis. This is lysing the cell and bursting it open to release all these viral particles to go infect more bacteria cells. And now the lysogenic cycle. And the lysogenic cycle, not all viruses go through the lysogenic cycle, but if it does, it starts the same way where the virus has to infect the host cell because it's a virus. It has to insert its genome into the host genome, and this becomes a prophage. At this point, once the viral genome is integrated into the host's chromosome, it's called a prophage. And then that a bacterial cell is going to replicate, do its thing, go through binary fission, replicate the viral genome along with it. Eventually, some type of stressful condition is going to tell this virus, ah, I'm ready to start replicating. It's going to remove or excise itself from the uh, host bacterial chromosome and then hijack host machinery. And then it will start replicating and making viral parts, assembling those parts together and then lysing the cell and releasing. So at this point down here, this is where we've entered the lytic cycle because it leads to cell death and the bursting of the cell. And the way that I think it's kind of useful to remember the difference between lyse, uh, lytic and lysogenic cycles is that lytic is a shorter word and it spends a sh the, the viral genome spends a shorter amount of time in the bacterial host cell because it's immediately just replicating itself and leading to cell death. Lysogenic is a longer word 
and the viral genome is spending a longer time inside of the bacterial host cell because it's taking advantage of just hanging out in the host cell and letting the bacteria replicate itself. So hopefully that helps. Lytic, short amount of time. Lysogenic, usually a longer amount of time. So you may be wondering why would a virus want to integrate its genome into the host bacterial genome? And it's for a few reasons. So first off, the bacterial cell is just going through binary fission, it's reproducing itself, and it's replicating the viral genetic material along with it. So the virus can take advantage of that replication cycle. It doesn't have to do any work. The bacteria is taking care of everything. And then two, the presence of phage DNA, or when that uh, viral DNA inserts itself into the bacterial genome, can actually alter the bacteria. And it's been observed that certain species of bacteria, like Vibrio cholera, are actually more virulent when the phage DNA is inserted into the genome. So the presence of the phage DNA makes bacteria more virulent. It gives them uh, the ability to maybe make a toxin or survive certain conditions, which is great for the virus. That's what the virus wants because that's their host. So they're a parasite. They want their host to survive and propagate and reproduce until that uh, viral genome goes through induction, excises out of the host chromosome, takes over the cell, and eventually kills the cell. But while the viral genome is integrated into the host chromosome and it's in the form of a prophage, then it can give the bacteria certain genetic advantages in its environment. And when a bacteriophage is going through this process of inserting its genome, that genome inserting itself into the host chromosome, and then excision, that viral genome being removed or excised from the host chromosome and packaging itself to make new viral particles, you can actually see right here that the when the virus pinches itself off from the host chromosome, it can take a little piece of the host chromosome with it, and that can get packaged with the virus. And then when that virus goes and infects a new cell, it inserts a little bit of the other bacterial's chromosome into this new bacterial chromosome. And this is a type of horizontal gene transfer. And if you recall, the other example of horizontal gene transfer we talked about was bacterial conjugation. They used the sex pillus and the sharing of plasmids, or those little circular pieces of DNA. This is another example of horizontal gene transfer, or genetic recombination, where genetic material is being shared between different organisms. And how does this benefit? This increases diversity, and it just increases the chance that genetic material will be moved from organism to organism recombined, and then that may give some new organism an advantage in its environment. Now let's talk about the life cycle of an animal virus. So now we're not talking about bacteriophage anymore. We're not talking about infecting bacterial cells. We're talking about infecting animal cells. But you'll see here that these steps should look very similar because they are very similar. So you've already learned it once. So first we have adsorption. The virus attaches very specifically to the surface of a specific type of cell that it's infecting. It's going to penetrate or enter the cell instead of like a bacteriophage though, injecting its genome kind of like a syringe into the inside of the bacteria. For an animal virus, most often, it's gonna be really the whole viral particle that's going to um, enter and then uncoat. And then it is still going to uh, release its viral genome in order to hijack the cell. It's going to assemble all of the parts it needs to make a new virus. So it's going to make capsid proteins and envelope proteins and replicate its nucleic acid. And then it's going to be released. And you'll see here that we aren't bursting or lysing the cell. This is an example of an enveloped virus. And where does an enveloped virus get its envelope from? It comes from the membrane of the host cell. 
and a virus is not able to make its own membrane or the, um, the components to make that envelope itself. So it gets it from the host cell by assembling at the membrane of the host cell and then pinching off or budding off and then going to find another animal cell to infect. And you'll see this is kind of beneficial for the virus because it can just turn this animal cell into a virus factory and not lice or kill the cell and just continue budding off new viral particles. Now influenza virus or flu virus is an example of a virus that does have an envelope and it gets that envelope from the host cell. So we see the same process again, just be comfortable going through this process where influenza virus attaches to the surface of a specific cell type. It's going to absorb, attach, and enter. It's going to release its genome. So the um, influenza virus has viral RNA. And then that viral RNA is going to go to the nucleus because that's where all of the machinery and instructions in a, a eukaryotic cell are. And it's going to take over that machinery in order to assemble itself. So it's going to make new parts. It's going to replicate its genome. It's going to put all those parts together and then release by budding off of the surface and then go find more uh, host cells to infect. So just know, make sure you're comfortable knowing this process. HIV uh, or human immunodeficiency virus is again an enveloped virus and it attaches very specifically to the surface of a specific cell because viruses have a lot of specificity, specificity for what cell they're attaching to. For HIV, it's going to attach specifically to helper T cells. And we'll talk about this more later whenever we get to, um, goodness, whenever we get to talking about the immune system, but helper T cells are a type of white blood cell. So you can see how HIV, which th can then progress into AIDS, does really harm the immune system because it's targeting white blood cells, which are part of our immune response, and they are a very essential part of the immune response. But we'll talk about that later. Now, HIV attaches specifically to the surface of the cell. It adsorbs or attaches. It's going to release its viral genome. And HIV, instead of just um, immediately kind of just going into the nucleus and replicating its genome, it actually integrates itself into the host genome or into the human genome. And that should look familiar. That should look like the lysogenic cycle where that became a prophage. In terms of a eukaryotic cell though, it's called a provirus. So know the difference between a prophage and a provirus. A provirus is a virus inserting its genome into a eukaryotic cell and that's what HIV does. And then after inserting itself into the host genome, it's going to hijack host machinery, make more of its uh, genome replicate itself, and then bud off of the surface of the host cell because it has an envelope and it gets its envelope from that host cell. And we're going to, uh, this slide's going to come up again in a little bit, and we'll talk about a few more things with HIV. This is just a micrograph showing you the process of an, how an enveloped virus buds off of the surface of a cell and develops that envelope. And so it gets, again, it gets that envelope from the membrane of the host cell. Now let's talk a little bit about latent and persistent viral infections. And we'll talk about an example for each one of these on the next few slides. But I'm gonna just show you what's happening with the number of virions or viral particles during a latent and persistent infection. So see on the y-axis, we have the number of virions or viruses or viral particles in the system. And then on the x-axis, we have the time. So it, this is the time in days right here. And then past this, we have the time in like months or years. And so for a persistent and latent infection, really, they both are going to start with an acute infection. It's going to be whenever you are first infected, there's a high number of viral particles and you experience symptoms. For a latent infection, 
that those viral particles are going to go to zero, basically, in your system. Your body is not going to recognize any viruses around. Your immune system is not going to be aware there are any viruses around. And then later on, something is going to waken up those viral particles that were hiding away, and then your immune system is going to become aware. And then there's going to be a high enough viral load where, again, you experience uh, the signs and symptoms of whatever infection you have. Now for a persistent infection, it starts with an acute infection, and then your immune system works hard, the viral load goes way, way, way down, but over time, the number of viral particles consistently increases until it may overtake uh, your immune system and your immune system isn't able to handle the viral load anymore. And for both of these, just recognize that as the number of viral particles increases, you're kind of thinking of that in terms of um, signs and symptoms. So the more viral particles in your system, the more likely you are to experience signs and symptoms of a disease. And we're going to see uh, whenever we get to this slide, but persistent, you can also say chronic. So a persistent infection is also a chronic infection. Now the latent infection example, and this example is chickenpox or the varicella zoster virus. That's the causative agent for chicken pox and shingles. And with a latent infection, remember that there's that initial acute infection. And for varicella zoster virus, that initial acute infection is chicken pox. So it's that initial infection. And then remember latent um, infections go dormant or they just are, become completely invisible to your immune system. So after 10 to 12 days of having chicken pox, the varicella zoster virus will go dormant in nerve ganglia cells. So it'll just hide away, stop, it will become, um, it'll just stop reproducing, it'll become dormant. And then later on in life, you can experience the latent infection and that varicella zoster virus can be no longer become dormant. It can start replicating and hijacking cells again. And that's what people experience as shingles later on in life. The example for a persistent or chronic infection is HIV. And again, a chronic infection doesn't just go away or become completely dormant over a long period. It is actually recurrent and the viral particles are slowly replicating and taking over cells over a long period of time. So if left completely untreated, uh, someone with HIV could experience no, sim no symptoms for many years because that virus is kind of slowly chipping away at those helper T cells or white blood cells. Eventually though, that persistent and chronic infection will become apparent with immune function. So immune function will drastically drop as you don't have any more helper T cells or you just have too few to help your immune system function. Eventually, all of that chronic damage can progress into AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So this is something that's happening over years sometimes until eventually enough of those white blood cells are damaged and you don't you aren't able to mount immune responses re anymore. So let's talk for a second about HIV again. I told you we'd return to that one slide. And let's talk about it in terms of retrovirus. So HIV is a retrovirus and let's talk about why that is. We're going to focus on this very specific enzyme it has, reverse transcriptase, and how do we know it's an enzyme? It ends in A-S-E, ACE. Now, here's this image again. So you know how HIV attaches to the cell and releases its viral genome. But why is it called a retrovirus? And what is this reverse transcriptase doing? So we learned about transcription. We learned about transcription and translation. And let's put this up here again. So if you remember, it's DNA to RNA. To protein. And that's the way that things always go, right? 
Well, viruses are a little weird, as you've seen already. And retroviruses can actually go from RNA to DNA. So you should be like, what? That's crazy. Things aren't supposed to go that way. Well, you need a very, very, very specific enzyme in order to do that. And HIV has this enzyme. And that's how it's able to integrate its RNA genome into a human's DNA genome. Because it reverses its RNA genome into DNA using reverse transcriptase, so it can then integrate itself into the host genome. So that's specifically what a retrovirus does. It inserts into the genome by converting its RNA genome into a DNA um, strand of nucleic acids so it can be in inserted into the host genome. So now we've seen that viruses are closely related to the host cells replication cycles and the host cells metabolic machinery. And by se being so closely related and kind of messing with the innards of the, of the host cell, it leads it to possibly causing cancer. And there are certain viruses that can uh, increase the likelihood of developing cancer later on. And those viruses are called oncogenic viruses. And a couple examples are human papilloma, papillomavirus or HPV. This can increase the chances for developing cervical cancer. And then hepatitis C can lead to liver cancer later on in life. And here's some other examples too. I'm not gonna ask anything specifically in terms of what virus can cause a specific cancer. I just want you to be aware that there are oncogenic viruses, and this is really because a virus's replication cycle is so closely related to the host cell's machinery. Now, because viruses are so specific, they can be engineered to kind of have specific jobs as well. And something that they can help us do is gene therapy. Gene therapy is transplanting a new gene into a cell and replacing something that's missing or defective in another one. So if a gene isn't working, gene therapy, the idea is to cut out or replace that gene with a functioning gene. And viruses can help us do this. So there are special viruses, they're AAV or adeno-associated viruses. They can be engineered or packaged with some type of healthy gene. And then that virus can find the correct cell, the appropriate cell that it attaches to, and deliver that functioning gene to the appropriate cell. Really, really fascinating kind of realm of research. And we're gonna see on the next slide as well that this is, is specifically talking about an animal virus and, in, and infecting or delivering to an animal cell but we can also use bacteriophages to our advantage as well. Phage therapy uses bacteriophages to treat bacterial infections. So remember that viruses are very specific for what cells they attach to. Bacteriophages specifically infect bacteria. So that means bacteriophages can be engineered to kill specific types of bacteria in the body. And that is one way that an infection can be cleared instead of using something like antibiotics, because antibiotics aren't necessarily extremely specific for the individual type of bacteria it's treating. It's gonna kill a lot of your really good microbiome too. The benefit of something like a bacteriophage is that it can be engineered for a very, very, very specific type of bacterial cell. So know the difference between gene therapy and phage therapy. Gene therapy, we're really talking about animal viruses. Something like that um, AAV or adeno-associated virus. And we're talking about editing genes or editing the genome and changing the genome in some way. For phage therapy, we're talking about bacteriophages. And we're talking about those bacteriophages targeting specific bacteria in the body and treating an infection. So you know the difference between those two. All right, the last thing we're talking about in this lecture is prions.
And prions are not viruses, but they are kind of infectious particles um, that aren't living things. So we talk about them alongside viruses, but they're not the same thing. Prions are just misfolded proteins that encourage other proteins around them to misfold and cause problems. And we're going to see that they are transmissible and they can cause very serious neurodegenerative diseases. So they, those misfolded proteins kind of build up and form plaques and those plaques um, build up in nervous tissue. And we'll see a few examples in a few slides. But they're not the same thing, viruses and prions. Viruses are actually a little more complex than prions and viruses are extremely, extremely simple. So a virus has uh, the protein coat and its genetic material, but prions only are made of proteins. So they're only that misfolded protein. That's it. Viruses cause lots of types of infections. Prions, though, are primarily going to be these neurodegenerative diseases and target nervous tissue or the nervous system. So let's see a few examples. So first off, just take a look at this protein and how it misfolds. I'm not going to ask you anything about alpha helices or sheets or anything like that. I just want you to see that whenever a normal prion misfolds and is encouraged to do so by a diseased prion, it is actually the three-dimensional shape that is changing. And if you remember, proteins need that three-dimensional shape in order to have their function, their functionality. So by becoming a diseased prion, they're now a non-functional protein, whatever they were doing before, and they take up this orientation that's going to cause plaques or build up um, in nervous tissue. So here are some examples of prion diseases. There's Kurtzfeld-Jacob disease, Kuru, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease. I'm sure we've all heard of that one. And then variant Kurtzfeld-Jacob disease. And what all of these have in common is that they form these plaques in the brain and ultimately destroy brain tissue and cause this deterior deterioration or shrinking of the brain. And in also all of these, they haven't been observed to be transmissible by normal everyday contact, like breathing the same air or body fluids or anything like that, but they are transmissible by ingesting uh, nervous tissue from someone that's infected. In terms of Kuru, this was very common among the people of New Guinea for a long time because part of their funeral rituals was to eat the nervous tissue or the brain tissue of loved ones that had passed away. And so these prions that had misfolded in some initial individual um, was then transmissed to a lot of people of that tribe and was present for a long time. Now, um, I believe the last death from Kuru in New Guinea was in the early 2000s or maybe even before that. So it was eventually found out that that was going on and, and um, they were informed and educated and so they no longer practice that. But again, this is not just, a, you don't just like breathe it in through the air or anything like that. And it, we don't really understand though what the initial cause is if someone doesn't come in contact with infected nervous tissue. And because it could just be that these prote proteins are misfolding for some unknown reason. It's not super well known right now. But um, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, this is specifically in cows when they experience this prion disease. And when humans eat the infected nervous tissue of a cow that has mad cow disease, we ultimately develop this VCJD or variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. But again, in all of these cases, uh, very similar things are happening in the brain in terms of kind of destroying this brain tissue. So specifically with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, just remember we're talking about prions. So this is from some normal human protein that is misfolding and causing prions to build up. The buildup of these prions ca causes this spongiform uh, features in the brain, this, these sponge-like lesions that are from the uh, blood flow and nutrient flow to the brain being cut off by these prions building up. And this is off. This can be really fast moving. Um, most often it's going to be fatal 
within a year. And it's going to cause a lot of different types of uh, neurological side effects from memory loss to issues with motor function and stuff like that. The big issue with this right here is that prions are extremely, extremely resilient. So to kill a prion, it's not just killed by cooking it or microwaving it or even any of the standard sterilizing surgical methods. Prions are really only killed in extremely, extremely high heat in like an autoclave for a very long amount of time. They're very, uh, very resistant and very difficult to get rid of in the environment. But it is also very rare. It's very uncommon. But we're going to talk, that does lead us into the next topic that we're going to talk about. And the next thing we'll talk about is um, environmental control of microbes. So how can we use different things like heat or desiccation in order to control the number of microbes in our environment? And that'll be for the next lecture.